Lynn, yeah. can you unmute? Yeah. I, I had already unmuted, but it didn't unmute. And so I got it a second time. Anyway, good morning and welcome to everybody, uh, whether you're here now or later um, <coughs> on Facebook or on our church website. We're committed to welcoming everyone, no exceptions. We're a progressive Christian church that strives to follow the teachings of Jesus. And we work for just peace and just hope for all. Wherever you are on your journey, we're glad you found us here today. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everyone. I have Lily here to help me with the call to worship. So I will start and then she will join with you in the hall if you'd like to speak it out loud or just uh, read it. This day, God, may we may we worship with gladness this day god may we dream your dreams this day god may we reflect your love <clears throat> god may we seek your peace this day god may we know your forgiveness this day god may we walk with faith this day god may we live with hope this day god may we seek and work for justice this day god may we praise authentically this day, God, may we serve with delight. Uh, join with us in the opening prayer, please. God of grace and glory, we thank you that you judge us not by the lack of perfection in our actions, but by our readiness to live boldly with faith. We thank you that your forgiveness extends to our named and unnamed transgressions. Help us as individuals and a congregation to trust you more fully and follow where you lead. We pray that your name may be glorified in all the earth and others would see you through, through us as we seek to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, our example. Amen. Man, that was beautiful. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 21. I invite you to hear these words. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, 
a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall, shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother, he said. The man said to Jesus, teacher, I've kept all of these since my youth. And Jesus looking at him, he loved him. And he said, you lack one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come back and follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked. And he went away grieving for he had many possessions. Okay. I think it's me now, right? All right. So um, I'm gonna read about Saul's experience with divine light. When Jesus came into the world and told people that loving God and loving one another was more important than anything else they could do, many people were confused. They spent long hours studying all the rules and rituals they thought were important so they could worship God the right way. The rules had been part of their lives for generations and affected how they ate, how they dressed, how they worked, how they played, how they married, and how they prayed. Now Jesus came and said to love each other, forgive each other, and not worry so much about the rules. Many people did not want to change. Saul was one person who did not like the changes Jesus brought. He liked things the way they were, and he thought all the old rules and rituals were very important. He even helped the priests arrest those who had followed Jesus and were teaching what Jesus taught. He would track them down and take them from their homes, and many were killed. But one day, everything changed for Saul. He was traveling with companions on the road to Damascus, a city in the land where Jesus had lived. More of Jesus' disciples were hiding in Damascus, and he was going there to find them. It had been a normal day, with stops to water the pack animals, and the warm sun was shining high above them as they considered stopping for the midday meal. Suddenly, Without any warning, a bright light flashed around Saul and he fell to the ground in shock and fear. The light was unlike the light of the sun. It was brighter than many suns and yet it didn't burn his skin. It was all around him, but it did not come from any particular place. It didn't have a form, but the light spoke to him. Saul, why are you persecuting me? The voice from the light said. Saul trembled, but he asked, who are you? And the voice in the light answered Saul, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Rise and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. When the light was gone, Saul discovered he could not see. He wasn't injured, and he felt no pain, but his eyes were completely blind. His companions had heard the voice as well, but they'd seen no one. They helped Saul as they continued their journey into the city. For three days, Saul waited in the city. He pondered what had happened, and he waited for a message that would tell him what to do. Saul had no idea what would happen next, but he did know that he felt different. The light had changed him. Somehow, the light that said it was Jesus had been all around Saul and within him as well. It felt like that light had been shining in every part of his being, in his body, his heart, his mind, and his soul. And there was another amazing thing. Jesus had lived and died before Saul was born, and yet Saul now felt like he had really met Jesus. He could hardly believe it himself, but Saul no longer, no longer wanted to persecute Jesus or hurt anyone who followed him. For three days, Saul thought about these things, prayed, and sat in silence. His friends couldn't get him to eat or drink or tell them what he was thinking. After three days, Saul had a special visitor. The visitor was Ananias, a disciple of Jesus. He had heard about Saul helping the priests and arresting many disciples. 
He didn't want to be anywhere near Saul, but Jesus had appeared to him in a vision and asked that Ananias be the one to help Saul. So Ananias went to find him. Brother Saul, Lord, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road to Damascus, has sent me to help you. He kindly explained to the blind man. Immediately, Saul felt his vision clear and his eyes were normal again. He looked at Ananias with gratitude and wonder. Saul knew his eyes were back to normal, but he wasn't the same as he had once been. For the rest of Saul's life, he told people about Jesus and his experience with the divine light. He traveled far and wide and worked hard to help all of Jesus' disciples. He became known throughout the land as Paul and as an outspoken champion of Christ's teachings. He was now hated by the priests and spent years in prison for his beliefs, but he never went back to his old ways and he never forgot the light that was Jesus. I invite you to join with me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and the living out of these words be wholly acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I have a confession to start. Uh, this sermon has been percolating in me for a while. And uh, I have a really beautiful sermon written and I'm not sure how much of it's gonna come out today because this morning I woke up and uh, felt a tug of a different direction. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But what I need from you first, this is sort of a, a participation sermon. So I need you guys to grab a piece of paper and a writing utensil. So I'll give you a minute for that. Go ahead and grab your piece of paper and a writing utensil. And if I was going to entitle this piece of paper that I just asked you to get, and if there's two of you sitting there, make sure you each have one. Um, I would title it one thing, just like the sermon title, one thing. Uh, I think I see most everyone's back. It looks like everyone's back. I'm waiting for one person to get started. Okay, here we go. So this, this scripture is, um, if you have a, a Bible in front of you and you looked at the heading, you know, I always liked to, to look as a kid growing up, look at the little cheater headings, which of course somebody added to the Bible. Those aren't there. Um, but it always says the, the rich young man, right? The rich young man, that's, that's the title this, uh, this person in the, in the story gets. And, and really, he goes to Jesus because he's so faithful, he's so devoted to him, or that's his thoughts about his understanding of his own discipleship, of his own faith journey, of his own sojourning, that, that he is so faithful to Jesus. And But there's something in his spirit, you can hear it in his question, there's something in his spirit that he knows is, is, is off, like, he knows that there's more to be had. There's more to, to this faithfulness journey, if you will. Um, and so he asked Jesus, like, and you hear it in his, in his confession to Jesus. I've been doing all of these things since I was young, since I, was, since I, since I first learned about faith and devotion, right? I do all the things. I, I can checklist all of the things that I have done. And even though... His confession to Jesus um, that he has been so faithful, that he's almost been so religious, right? Checking all of the items in that box off. There's something in him that he still is concerned about his eternal life. And, you know, we, we talk about eternal life as there's a place to go, right? Or, or there, that when we leave this life, we're going to go to the next one. But really, when you look at the Greek translation and the Hebrew, even more the Hebrew, 
it's not so much the afterlife as it is eternal life begins here and now, right? It begins here and now. And so there's this, you can hear this sort of um, wrestling, if you will, in this rich young man of realizing that maybe he doesn't have eternal life. Maybe his checklist, his religiousosity, if you will, that there's something missing. And so when he goes to Jesus and he says, hey, good teacher, you know, it's always good to start with a compliment. Huh? I'm a teacher. I like when my kids start with a compliment. A good teacher, what is it I can do to get an eternal life? And who knows, maybe he was thinking, Jesus would say, oh, I know you, sir. You're amazing. You're doing all the right things. Continue on. But that happens so rarely in the scriptures, right? That, that happens so rarely. There's always something. And in this scripture today, Jesus says one thing, right? And as I think about that, I think, whew, wouldn't it be nice to just have one thing? Uh, what, one thing that I could do to be more faithful, to be a better wife, to be a better mom, to be a better teacher, to be a better disciple, to be a better church person, to be a better justice seeker, to be a better... Um, giver of compassion, right? I just wish there was one thing. How nice would that be, right? I suspect that uh, you, like me, there's more than one. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in a minute. But Jesus just says to this guy, it's, it's only one thing. There's there's only one thing. And, and I'm like, oh, lucky you, man. Like, only one thing? And Jesus says, you know, uh, I know you and I love you. And I love, I love when Jesus sees people, right? There's no, there's no acknowledgement that they had a relationship ahead of time. Um, and I love when the text always will say this about Jesus. I know you and I love you. Like how, how did Jesus know him? Like he saw him, right? And how many people in our lives actually know us and see us for who we are? And the text says, I know you and I love you. And I know the one thing. And for, for the, for the rich young ruler, rich young man, um, of course it was possessions, right? He had too much stuff or, you know, we don't really know. Did he have too much stuff? Did he have too much money that was getting in the way of his faithfulness? Was he too focused on things and not relationship? Had had possessions become his God? We don't know. This uh, scripture is annoyingly vague, honestly, huh. especially for a preacher. Or maybe it's so vague because the ambiguity in, is somewhere in our story, right? Somewhere in the midst of that, we experience the one thing and whether ours is his or ours is different than his, that, that one thing for him is possessions. And Jesus just says, go sell your things, give your money to the poor, and then come back. And we're, and we're good. And you'll know eternal life that moment. And then, of course, in this text, in this scripture, in, in this text, in this scripture, um, he goes away and he, he's grieved. That's what the that's what the Hebrew, the Greek says. He's grieved to, and grieving is different in our culture than it was back then, right? Grief, grief was a longer process, a learning journey, a longer journey, and so he was so grieved. But was he grieved because of his possessions that he didn't want to get rid of, or was he grieved because he wanted so badly to have eternal life, and he knew he couldn't take that step? He knew he couldn't do that one thing, that his religiosity of doing all of the things and following all the rules, all of those years wasn't enough. And it's easier when you have a checklist, right, than when there's actually actions to go into it. And as I read this text, I, it's like I said already, like, I just, I want there to be one thing and not a list of things. But the truth is, you know, if you if you've ever been to AA or NA or any of the um, the uh, anonymous groups, 
the number one step in their 10 steps is always to name, right? That you have an issue, that you have a problem and that you can't do it on your own. And I think, I think that's the hardest thing for us, right? Is naming the one thing, is coming to that place where we can name the one thing. I, I recently started going back to counseling because uh, it just feels so heavy right now. Everything feels so heavy for me. And, and I've made excuse after excuse of why I shouldn't go to counseling. Um, but at some point I had to be honest that maybe I was, it was time and I've only had one session with my counselor so far, but he asked me something that just shook me to my core, uh, and, and counseling and, and I've been thinking about that so much. And then it plays, it, it ties into this sermon. And so the thing I want us to consider today, and, and if you'll take out your piece of paper and your pencil is the one thing, Right. What's the one thing that we lack, that you lack, that I lack, that gets in the way of some aspects of our life? And what I've decided I'm going to do with this list is this is going to be my commitment during Lent. I get that Lent's not here quite yet, but it's coming very soon. That this is going to be the list that I work on in Lent. Every week, I'm going to go down this list, which we're going to go through together. And I'm going to give my attention and attentiveness to that one week during Lent. Okay, here we go. Let's first thing. So I want you to name the one thing that makes you happy. Write that down. What's the one thing that makes you happy? And then the question is, what, how do you foster that in your life? How do you, how do you go about finding that space, that place, that time, that whatever it your, is your list to make sure that there's some happiness in your life, some joy? I don't know about you, but I felt joy this week. <laughs> Come Wednesday around noon. Getting up in the morning and reading the news has been much easier <laughs> the last couple of days. What makes you happy? What's the one thing? Then I want you to think about a significant relationship. It could be your best friend. It could be a family member. It could be a significant other. Think of the one thing that you could work on to better that relationship. Write that down for me. What's the one thing that you could do that you could make a difference in that relationship? And then the question becomes like, how do you go about that, right? How do you work on that? The next is one, one thing that you could do to be more healthy. Diet, exercise, meditation, what, whatever that plants, time in your garden, whatever. What's one thing you could do to be more healthy? I still see people writing, so I'll give you another second. Next, next one thing is what, what's one thing you could do to deepen your connection with God, with the divine? What's one thing that you could do to deepen your connection with God.
So my next one, the, the thing, you know, I'm always trying to grow as a human. And I feel like the one, one of the ways that I grow is when I'm challenged, when I'm pushed, right? So what's something that challenges you? What's one thing that challenges you? The next is if you have a profession, um, you know, I'm a teacher, even if you're retired, the question is what's one thing you could do to be better, better retired, better teacher, better nonprofit organizer, whatever, whatever it is you do. What is one thing that you can focus on that you could do? Just two, I have two more for you. Hang with me, please. My next one is, you know, we're all here because we love Church of the Valley and this family, this community. And so my question is, what's one thing that you can do to be more committed to this faith community? What's been holding you back? And, and I know most of you, and, and I know for myself that I'm really sort of socially conscious awareness of what's going on in our country right now. And, you know, I took really seriously the words that our new president said um, about healing and, and, and ending this uncivil war. And so my question is, you know, and, and there's a lot of talk about unity, but my question to you is what's the one thing that you can do to help heal our nation? One thing you can do. There's seven things on your list that I just counted. There's 11 weeks before Palm Sunday. So maybe you could add to that list if you wanted to, or you could just start this in Lent to join me with focusing on one of these one week at a time. And I don't necessarily think these are standalone, right? That what makes you happy, what challenges you, what makes you more healthy. Those are things you can build on week after week. And, and the thing that occurs to me as I read this, as I read this text, as I, as I, as I sort of examine this scripture, 
this week and looked at it is, you know, I'm sure the grief of the rich man was about transformation, is about growth, right? Because I remember my mentor said to me a long time ago, people don't like to grow because growing means changing. And one of the hardest things for humans to do is to change, right? Change as a church, change as a country, change as a, as, as a world, change as a family and a relationship. Change is just hard. It pushes us. It makes us, it makes us grow. And, and the word that I think about is transformation, right? It's just not overnight. There's a, there's a process of transformation. And, you know, as he went away grieved, I think he didn't want to change. And I think that's true of a lot of us, right? We changing is hard. We've always done it that way, whether it's in our family or our schools or our our workplace or our church. But I feel like what this scripture calls us to in this season in our in our country, in our world, in our in our church in Lent calls us to is that openness of transformation. That openness of being authentic, of, of being honest with our one things and focusing on that. It occurs to me like if we were as a church working on these things, like how bold we could be as a church, as a people, as a community, that we could be seeds of transformation in our families, in our local areas, in our places of employment. And wow, I can only imagine what that would look like. One thing, there's only one thing, right? <laughs> we have a list of seven, but the scripture says one. I invite you to uh, continue to think about those things, those one thing that you can work on to be transformed. May it be so. Amen. That's a lot to think about. (laughs) Thanks, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now is the time that we're asked to give back. And um, the one thing that this poor rich guy, that was a deal breaker for him, but hopefully it's not for us. So Uh, We don't have a plate to pass around, but um, you know the deal. Go to Venmo, go to the website and um, click on Venmo or PayPal and uh, make your contributions. Um, We have some beautiful music from Lorian to uh, continue, so I'm going to screen share that.
Thank you, Lorian. That was beautiful. As we start our time of shared prayer, our uh, sharing our joys and concerns with one another, uh, we're going to start today with blessing two of our prayer quilts. So I'm going to invite you to join me in those blessings. The first one is for the Stegall family. That's uh, Heather, David, Victoria, Natalie, Allura, and Allison. Uh, David's mom recently passed away from COVID-19. And as I understand it, she was, I think it was a pediatric nurse, uh, was her profession. I think Lee told us last week. And, um, and just such a, such a huge loss, not only to them, but to uh, those that she served. And uh, some of us know how difficult it is to lose a parent. And so we want to send them this, this quilt of comfort. Will you join me in, in this prayer of blessing? Loving parent, great comforter. We ask your blessing upon the Stiegel family. We know that they are hurting and grieving and we pray that this quilt will be a tangible representation of the love and prayers that we send to them. When they wrap themselves in this, may they feel not only our arms around them, but the arms of their beloved, their mom, their grandma, knowing that even death cannot part us. Be with them through this difficult time. We send our prayers, amen. Our second quilt is for, um, a woman named Krista Giordano. She is a colleague of Don Smith. I believe Don asked for prayers for her friend last week. Um, she's going through a tough time. She's got both parents um, who are ailing and, um, you know, potentially nearing the end of their life. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're aging, they're in decline. And it's a, it's a very trying time for um, Krista and um, for her, for her family. And so, okay, I'm going to ask you uh, if you have a joy or concern you want to share to just raise your hand in front of the screen or use the little hand up uh, button and we'll share those together. And Lorian, I see you first. Sorry, took me a second there. Um, I'd like to ask for ongoing prayers. I've, I've, I've put his name on, on the UCV group um, several times, but for Trevor and for his family, he is the 20 year old son of a friend of mine who has been um, suffering from and fighting uh, medulloblastoma for about five years. And he is terminal at this point. He is in hospice and he's suffering quite a lot. And his mom, Kim, is suffering alongside of him. Her life has been wrapped up in caring for him and taking him to treatments all over the country and everything for the last five years. I've watched him grow up through high school along with uh, my girls. He's their age and, and it just breaks my heart. And I know that they, they really need all the prayers and love that they can get. Together we pray, hear us, oh God. Other prayers? Donna? Okay, let's keep Sherry and the Turner family in our prayers. It's the loss of her mother. And Lori is just coming along really slow. She just gets worn out so much because she had an underlying disease before she got the COVID. But she's trying to stay perky, but she can't do too much right now. 
Thanks for those updates, Donna. Together we pray. Hear us, oh God. Other prayers, Catherine? Well, uh, my prayer is a prayer of thanksgiving and uh, I'm glad our elections and our inauguration is over and uh, I'm glad it went my way. And uh, anyway, it's a great time in America. We have a lot of work to do. We still have a lot of work to do, but I think it's uh, the good news is that it's been uh, brought forward. So, so we kind of have an idea of what we need to do together. Together we pray, hear us, oh God. Other prayers from anyone? I'd like to offer up to um, my granddaughter's uh, paternal family. Um, her papa has come down with COVID and uh, now we find out that her grandma Tammy has COVID as well. And, and uh, Tammy has uh, COPD. Uh, stage four, very bad. So we're very concerned about her. Um, Juniper was with them in the exposure time. So uh, she and Amanda both got tested yesterday. So I'm, I'm praying that, uh, that she doesn't have it as well, but just want to offer a prayer for their recovery, their full recovery. Um, and also for Judy's dad, who, uh, who so far doesn't have it. Um, and then I want offer a prayer of thanksgiving uh, along the same lines as Catherine um, as my dog joins in the amen chorus here um, just that I was very encouraged that our new 50-50 senate reached a compromise so let's uh, just pray for our country as well together we pray hear us oh God any others and uh, we have company, so forgive the dog barking as uh, we pray together. Um, I just want to uh, lead us in the prayer that Jesus told his disciples, or maybe someone else could do that. Any, anyone else feel like uh, offering that prayer? Okay, it's a little quieter here. I think I can do it. Shush. No prayers from you. Shush. Quiet now. <laughs> Oh, let us pray together. And I'm going to use my own most comfortable words and invite you to do the same. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, as we come together for this time of sharing in a holy meal, I invite you to grab your elements, your crackers or bread or juice or wine or whatever you have for communion. I remind you that everyone is invited to this table. This is in our table and any way, shape, or form, but this is God's table, and all are invited. Um, I'm with you, Catherine, this uh, last week. I just, uh, man, I, I woke up on Wednesday morning, just, uh, or Thursday morning, I should say, just felt lighter, and um, yeah, I just felt, uh, just felt a new lightness about me, and, and I realized I'd been carrying so much stress uh, the last four years, and, and that weight of the last four years. And, you know, I <laughs> obviously have a lot of thoughts and opinions about everything that's transpired, especially in this new year. Um, but I'm also reminded, you know, when we're talking about an open communion table that the people at the table are not, they, they just don't look like us, right? And one of my favorite authors, I think I've shared this before is Anne Lamont. And Anne Lamont, uh, yeah, I just, I love Anne Lamont and her words are so beautiful, but you know, she has a, she's up in San Francisco and she goes to a Presbyterian church up in San Francisco and um, her pastor, which her pastor's name is going to, I think it was Jenny, is that right? Pastor Jenny, I haven't read her books in so long. Anyway, her, her pastor once said, and this was in the midst of uh, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, 
Um, and her pastor said at the communion table one time that everyone is invited to this table. And of course we all have this image of who that everyone should be. And she said in the midst of preparing the meal, even Dick Cheney and Anne Lamont tells the story how her eyes just came up really quick and looked like, don't say that name in our church, in our sanctuary. It needs to be saged now, you know, but that's, that's what everyone means, right? Those people who would have even been there on January 6th, I doubt they'd be at our church, but they'd be invited to the table. So I, I want you to remember that as we say, when we say all means all, right? And then, um, yeah, so I, I just, <laughs> I remind you of that this week as we gather uh, of the table of who, who that is including and who we share this meal with. And so we're reminded as Jesus gathered with his friends, he took bread, he gave thanks to God, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Every time you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. And then likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, he, he gave thanks to God, he blessed it, he, he poured it, he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins for um, grace everlasting. Let us pray. Pour out your spirit on us, O God, and on these gifts of bread and juice that make them be for us the body of Christ and the love of Christ poured out in abundance for us. May this holy meal strengthen us, comfort us, and convict us and move us into a place of action to work on our one thing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The bread of life and the cup of God's love given for all. Take, eat. I'm going to take communion. I love seeing all the coffee cups. <laughs> I want to close with um, the closing lines uh, this, this morning, this day, uh, the closing lines from Amanda Gorman's poem that she shared on Wednesday. And those of you on social media, if you've seen it, there's, there's all kinds of stuff out there, but it was so striking. And I, and I know I'm gonna preach about it when we come to Christmas soon or next time, or whenever I have the opportunity to preach um, at Christmas again. Uh, but she said, for there is always light. If we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Still gives me the chills. As we leave this place today, may we be brave enough to see the one thing and we, may we be brave enough to be that one thing and work that out. Go from this place, walk with faith, live with hope, and serve with the love of God. Amen.